Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate, where topical issues are discussed in a no hose bad manner. In other words, we call a spade by its name. Famous author Charles Handy once said, Citizenship is a chance to make a difference to the place where you belong. The worth of the Nigerian citizenship is at the top of my mind today. Comfort in Abuja is lending her voice to the conspiracy of silence on the issues of domestic violence and sexual abuse. On her part, Ejemai is talking about our responsibilities to depict our culture and tradition in the likeness in children's literature. And finally, but by no means the least, Omoni is advocating on the necessity of mentorship by public schools alumni. Sit back, the panelists are here to present your Sunday dose of provoking thought with no, with no host bars after this break. What is a Nigerian citizenship worth anyway? I watched with trepidation, anger, and surprise when last week, the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, Honorable Idris Wase, in what aptly fits into a national embarrassment, prevents Honorable Mark Tessak Bila, the member representing the Chief Constituency, from presenting a petition on behalf of his constituent writing under the umbrella of the Mutual Union of Thieves in America, MUTA. These were consigned Nigerians resident in the diaspora and who sought to register their protest over the utter neglect and wanting violation of the fundamental rights of their kids and kin back home in Nigeria by marauding and criminal headsmen. In that horrid encounter between Wase and Rebu Bila on the one hand, and the cavalier disposition of other members of the house, why is the horrible scene played out? The worthlessness of the Nigerian citizenship is put in graphic display from one of the most unfortunate places where it could have played out. I was so ached about the display that I couldn't help post a series of tweets in the manner so unusual of me in terms of the words I reserved for the Deputy Speaker. It is not only that Honorable Washe was ignorant, he was also arrogant and looked so self-assured while at it. His premises were fallacious and so his conclusions were bound to be faulty. It is as follows that Nigerians who are in diaspora cannot be heard in complaint about what is happening in their fatherland. Really? He said he would rather listen to a petition coming from Nigerians living in Nigeria, but not anyone in diaspora. Do they really know what is going, what is going on here if they're in America? Do they have dual citizenship? Was it asked with astonishing arrogance? Now, assuming some of the organization or some members of the organization have dual citizenship, how do we explain that a leader of parliament does not know that the Nigerian constitution is built on duality of citizenship? And by querying whether these patriotic citizens know what is going on here, we must really pause to wonder whether Honorable Wase is really with us in a world that continues to get narrower by the day. I think it is to our collective embarrassment and shame that Honorable Bila was eventually forced to drop the petition, thereby depriving the petitioners from their right of expression in an institution designed to aggregate the views of the citizens. What a victory for ignorance and arrogance, the bane of Nigeria. How do Nigerians in diaspora take pride in their fatherland when it is clear that their opinions back home don't matter? Or are they only consequential in Nigerian life in terms of their remittances back home? These are posters that go to the heart of the national question. Honorable Wase is a four-time member of the House of Representatives. With all the experiences he is expected to have gathered and the influence he wields in official and unofficial Nigerian life, that horrible display illustrates the leadership crisis in Nigeria 
and further underscores the need for a leadership recruitment process, as one of Nigeria's top leaders rightly argued. While the doubt of that encounter might have settled, the harsh realities or the harsh lessons, however, remain that the Nigerian citizenship is worth little or nothing, irrespective of where we are resident. So, Mr. Uh, Omoni, you, you, you followed that encounter that played out between uh, the, uh, the deputy speaker and uh, Honorable Bila last two weeks. What do you make of that, um, of that proceedings? Uh, it, it, uh, when I saw it, one of the first things I thought was, maybe they didn't even know that they were on TV. Yes. Okay? Because those, those were things that you would say privately in your living quarters. But when you are in front of the whole nation, you, sh you should be more circumspect to be sensitive about the kind of things you share and say. Now, now implying that Nigerians outside Nigeria do not have a right to be concerned, do not have a right to have a say with things that happen in Nigeria, is like you said, uh, a fallacy. Especially uh, in this age that some countries are, are, are trying to, to take on overseas voting, having people that don't live in the country who are citizens being able to vote in an election, and you have this kind of comment, it's, it's not acceptable. Uh, absolutely. I agree with you. When you talked about the angle of um, diaspora voting, as a matter of fact, when this whole event played out, part of the context I built around my tweet was that other countries like uh, Ghana, South Africa, even Mali, have all allowed their citizens who are in the diaspora to participate in the uh, leadership process at home. Uh, meanwhile, here in Nigeria, we are having problems having members of, who are in the diaspora to even have a say, not in the electoral process, but just to be heard on issues affecting their kids and kin back home. Very, very, very unfortunate. Now, um, uh, Ejimai, the we have a ministry, uh, we have a diaspora commission in Nigeria. Yeah. And in recent times, to uh, in fairness to the person in charge of that uh, commission, uh, uh, what is her name now? Abike. She's been doing some good job yes, really. and making interventions on behalf of Nigerians outside the shores of this country. And then uh, with, the, with what played out in the house, how do you reconcile uh, this is supposed to be a government that should work uh, as, uh, as a team? So how do you reconcile this, um, uh, 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 how should, should I call it, um, um, contradictions in terms of uh, the, the, the government handling of issues? I think for me, it just shows the lacuna in the knowledge, the gap between <laughs> the political class and, of course, um, the regular Nigerians. Because when you feel that you're not a part of the society or when you're so aloof, yeah. you're, you're so devout of reality, yeah. you, you think that you belong to a different class of people. So much so that you feel it is in your place to stop somebody from airing their opinion. The question should not even be whether or not these Nigerians are in diaspora. It's a question of every Nigerian should be given an opportunity to air their view. Sorry. And if you look at this thing, it goes way into our culture, deep into our roots, where because you're older than somebody, you don't want to give the opportunity to the person to air their opinion. Yeah. That is what played out here. Mm -hmm. And you know, you go around with that mentality. Well, um, we have some parts of Nigeria or Nigerians that are educated, they give room for development, for inclusion, they try to carry everybody along. Like you mentioned the work that Abike Dabiri is doing. She's always on Twitter pushing for the rights of Nigerians living abroad. Yeah. Then you have something like this being played out on the house. It just shows you the disparity in knowledge. Mm -hmm. And of course, we must continue to advocate for training for our leaders. He spent four times, you said, yes. in the house, yes. but of course, the, the, 16, yes. <laughs> the lack of knowledge 16, is still apparent. She's still wasted, yes. It's still apparent, actually. Now, comfort. Yes. Now, why, mm -hmm. while I watched that session, what also caught me was um, how other members sat as though what was being discussed never mattered to them. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. one of them said, Honorable Bila, sit down. And the young man moved to intimidation, he sat down. What does that say about how the House or House of Representatives, how does it function? Um, I mean, is it that none of them could have Ejima reason to um, amplify the, 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 the merits in Bila's presentations? 
when um, Ejimai uh, was making her comment, it occurred to me that really none of when she passed, when, when she uh, referred to Abike Dabiri, I thought that Abike herself, you know, would have, you know, come to his rescue, even if nobody else did. I thought she should have been the head of um, the diaspora desk. And I wondered, as you said, now more than ever that we do need support, not just from inside, but from without. How do they go back to the diaspora? For example, when they travel and they want to see the community, when it's when um, the diaspora community decides that they want to put money together to bring back into the country, to help the country, are they going to have the moral right and standing to ask the, these diasporans that they have said, well, you know, we, you don't have the freedom of expression in your own country, um, you know, to show your concern. And it just shows us the quality of leaders we have put in the National Assembly. I thought the constituency that had elected um, the deputy speaker would have been scandalized, horrified, and demanded for his ex for his immediate uh, recall. But alas, we had a pin drop silence. And so I hope that you know, with the number of things that we see seem to think are changing or we're opening our eyes on, that the next election circle, people will begin to say, look, we need people who are informed, because this was a complete. Um, and travesty uh, and showed an astonishing uh, amount of ignorance on the part of the deputy um, and speaker. But as I said, um, when you don't know anything, you, that's actually the time that you are the most arrogant. So it's unfortunate on all fronts. I, I agree with you, absolutely. Um, now, um, Mr. Moni, um, it is good to learn that um, when the speaker, the Honorable Speaker, returned back to the chambers, Honorable um, Femi Bajabia Miller, he, he had to uh, move Mr. Gbila to, um, to present the petition on behalf of his constituents who were in the diaspora. How do you see the act of the speaker? Well, it, it's uh, first saving for the national, uh, for the House of Representatives. Uh, uh, a, a bit of damage has been done, yeah. and um, I hope that the leadership of the House will try and um, connect with Nigerians in, in diaspora. You know, there was a time some years ago when there was this joke that every family in Nigeria had a relative in the UK. Yes. Uh, and I think it's much worse now. Uh, it, it just... Uh, and for people that are even trying to leave the country now, some of the things they will tell you is, even if I leave, my roots are here, family is here, uh, this is there, this is there. So if I go, I will always be linked to this land. Yeah, a part of you is still yeah. here. So, so one, one of the biggest things that these people can give us is to come back and to all, or even, even if they don't come back, to always be there uh, caring about the people they've left here because that means they have a uh, they, they they are vested in Nigeria. They will always be vested in Nigeria because mm. their people are here. So what do we do? Let's work with them. Sure. Okay, okay. Uh, now, Edom, I just to wrap up uh, uh, to wrap up uh, this session. The the deputy speaker was of the view that um, um, if you are not that if they are not in the country, how can they know what is happening here? I mean... You don't have to be a resident of a country to know what is happening in the world. I mean, the world has gone so globalized and we see people True. from outside the country making impact in their, in, their, in their home countries. And it's actually, the world is at a point where we are actually online, yes. real yes. time. I mean, if, if, if nobody, if anybody was uh, of a different impression, and it's COVID-19, has taught us that has flattened the whole world. It has become you know? so, so flat. There, there are times that something happens in Lagos, mm -hmm. and it is your relative uh, far away. Tells you about uh, it outside the country. And they are so you correct. You who are in Lagos knows. How can that actually happen? How can he claim that mm. 
if you're not in Nigeria, how do you know what's happening in Nigeria? Well, we all live on the internet. It just goes to further um, underscore the problem uh, uh, with leadership in Nigeria, and uh, we must commend the Speaker of the House of um, Rep for that um, intervention. And uh, with that, we've come to the end of this segment of the show. Um, when we come back from this break, Comfort gives us her own piece of advocacy. Table with us. The failure of women, the conspiracy of silence. Another day, another heartbreaking, heart-wrenching, depressing story of a wife being brutalized by her husband, a minor being sexually abused by her employer's husband, another being systematically raped by her male relatives, a father having carnal knowledge of their daughter, the hired hand committing statutory rape with his employer's daughter, or the boss groping and making indecent suggestions in the workplace. I could go on with these scenarios, but we are well conversant with them. People argue that with the advent of social media, we just have access to more information, not that these occurrences were less in times gone by. March 8th was Happy International Women's Day, a day set aside to celebrate the woman and the achievements of the movement for the emancipation of women the world over. I guess, in a nutshell. Okay. A lot has changed from 1909 when the celebration was held and from 1977 when the United Nations adopted the International Women's Day. Today, women not only have a day in a month, but have also usurped the whole month of March as Women's Month. Wahoo! Velisco, the Dutch fabric maker, even has a fabric for us with the inscription, all women, all united. The celebration brought women's issues to the fore with a call for action to government, especially. However, bringing it home, what exactly have we done to raise the voices of our women, ladies and girls, apart from overflogging the word empowerment? The Ministry of Women Affairs was established in 2000 with a very wish-washy agenda encapsulated as bringing development to the women and children. The crassness of the reason adduced for setting up a toothless, barkless pup of a bulldog is what is wrong with the ideals of the International Women's Day and its celebrations. What exactly are we happy about? The tokenism of the idea that there is a place of circle for the Nigerian woman to address her issues is infuriating. As 21 years down the line, I want to see a scorecard of what the Ministry of Women's Affairs has achieved vis-a-vis -vis International Women's Day. The rate of sexual crimes against women and the girl child is on a frightening trajectory. It reflects what society thinks of her female. The person to change that perception is we women, but we need strong voices strong leaders and commitment. I expected to see the Ministry of Women Affairs pushing for an amendment of the bill that gives 14 years jail term to a rapist to move to castration. Today, I woke up to the story of a boy who partook in the gang rape of a 16 year old a couple of years back. Four of the five boys have died and he feared he was next. He had murdered sleep and was seeking her forgiveness. He put a picture of her begging. He put up a picture of her begging that she forgives him and then he would reveal himself. The rape of her started all over again. This is where we have failed people like her. She had to relive the story in public. The woman in the chain of her story told her there was nothing she could do to help her after she had helped clean her up and treat her as best as she could after the horrendous assault. She never reported the incident. The four dead never faced the law. As it is, neither will this one. Sexual crimes go unpunished because we women have become the enablers. I feel very passionately about this subject. It's quite unfortunate. And I actually and I will the job open the floor to the silence. Um, for you to start first. <laughs> All right. Um, Comfort, you mentioned that um, we are complacent in the silence. Yes. When I read, when I read it, I, I felt that I felt that. Um, Olaimi, are you sure you're doing enough? Are you sure you're speaking out enough? Uh, most of the time, we are just horrified about this news that we, we read online. 
but do, do we take time to even leave a simple comment in support of the victim or a simple comment asking the government to do more or telling our husbands to stand up? Because I, I fear that we may actually need the men to actually stand up and do more because if I speak out, I need somebody to actually echo and say, yes, keep on going, keep on speaking out. Because, of course, I might say something and I fear that how will I be accepted after this, but, even in the workplace? But you know one very funny thing? Address is too short. Why did she go there? Oh. And who says it? You'll be shocked that a lot of times there's a woman. So you have the woman blaming the woman for what someone, someone had criminally done to her. It shows that there's, there's a really big problem of articulation of these issues by people. Um, right now, I'm, I'm reading the moment of lift by Melinda Gates. And uh, she's been around a lot of women. She's come to Africa, spoken to a lot of people, done a lot of research. And one of the things she says is, the woman does not even have a say, or many women do not have a say in how many children they will have, the spacing of, in that sense, they do not even, they do not have ownership of their own body. Well, for me, uh, what caught me in uh, Comfort's uh, script has to do with when she said that all these things have been happening before now, but it appears social media has only helped to bring it out in the fore. And it actually struck me because I tell you what, before the advent of social media, um, some of these, is when the traditional media, we don't have access to the newspapers, and then the media was strictly controlled, regulated by the government. There was no avalanche of private media as we have it today. It never occurred to me that some of these issues are actually um, happening. And so uh, I think to that extent, uh, we must give credit to social media, which has helped to a large extent to help at least before now, I think we can see more women using, deploying these platforms to even say their, uh, that, tell their stories and attracting interventions uh, here and there. So um, I also think comfort seems to be putting too much of the blame on the women. I think the way the society is structured um, and this, the whole stigma and blame and guilt that goes around um, people who come out to say what they have passed through in the hands of any form of um, abuse, uh, you might not want to uh, blame women so much. And so um, that is how I, I am seeing it. And then also, the, uh, her proposition that um, we should move uh, the punishment from 14th imprisonment to castration. I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, and <laughs> I'm a lawyer, and I think that might be too extreme in terms of um, uh, the theories okay, of punishment. Much, I, might not, I might not talk about the extremism of the punishment, but I want to hound on your point about how the men have a lot to do with this subject matter. Yeah. I must tell you, although I'm, yes, I'm highly educated, I've accomplished a lot, so many times that I have some very strong position yeah. on some issues, I always sit back and say, if I vocalize my point, what would my husband say? How will my husband feel? Yeah. In the office, I'm a female boss, I work in the public sector. Yeah. And of course, I see a lot of this passing side comments that actually very irritating to me, to my, of course, lower subordinates. And I've mentioned it a few times, but at some point in time, guess what? I have to just stop saying it because, of course, the female subordinate just laughs along and I'm on my seat completely irritated because this guy is passing a comment about your body and you're like, they do it all the time now. So yeah. the question is, at what point am I stepping out of my own lane? Yeah, well, you, so many things are actually, you know, now deciding how far Ola Emi can go with a position. There's something that we call the Stockholm um, syndrome. syndrome. Of course. Uh, uh, you just go along with your abuser. Yeah, you go along with your abuser. Yes. But let me ask Comfort something. But that's what I'm saying, Don't you though. think we should and then focus on our girls, bringing up our girls to be stronger women? What do you think about that? Focusing on the future. Yes, we've done some things wrong in the past. But going forward, what do you think we can do now? Bearing our generation and our girls coming exactly. up. So please tell us. And so for me that and so for me that is it. When it comes to 
you know, issues that affect, you know, people or a certain thing. We already know what the external problems are. We know who the aggressors are. But we need to focus more internally. And especially for me, in a time when there are platforms, there is a movement, there are pushes that give women the opportunity for them to latch onto. And my problem is I fear that we're not using those opportunities strong enough. We, we're not prioritizing these things as things that need to be put forward. So I think also it's, um, it, and I said it's for me, it's an issue of strong leadership. If we had women, if I hate this idea of affirmative action, which is like creating this women affairs thing. Okay, but unfortunately that's what we have. So if we have that, why can't we have women who genuinely have you know, the interest to move women's um, issues forward? So imagine, and Okonjo Ewela, imagine how in that, in that seat, we would have seen a lot more going, and I'm saying the action galvanized would have been able to make it easier for what you've just said, which is to strengthen our women, because we're going to now use her as our yardstick. I mean, women, girls get raped every single day, and who are the people in the forefront of keeping it quiet? It's the women. Okay. I don't want to spoil my marriage. Enough uh, now. <clears throat> Now, so for me, um, you talked Sorry, about the... You're saying we're not speaking out enough now. As it's happening right now, we're not being vocal about it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, well, I agree with you on that, but I just want to add that I think um, the advent, like I said before now, I think social media has to a large extent helped to... In fact, we remember what uh, the, lady, the lady that talked about the, um, one of these and entertainers who yes. go there. Um, Bisola. So, yeah, so I think social media has to a large extent helped, but I want to address the issue of um, the, the institutional response to this, okay, yeah. this social issue, talking about the Minister of Women Affairs. I don't even know who, who she is. I don't know who she is. So it raises serious concern as to <laughs> do they actually know what they are doing. This is a country where we have issues of abuse virtually every day. And yet the Ministry of Government, which was set up to be at the forefront of that um, issue, is barely, is barely seen. So I think um, you are right on point on that, on that institutional response. And I think that is what we, um, we have to really um, um, make for. serious advocacy about. Because uh, we, in recent past, we've heard about the sexual register and, and all of that. That ministry ought to be in the vanguard of that um, movement and making all the necessary uh, uh, institutional uh, uh, um, um, collaborations to see that these things are actually and also happening. Our laws also certainly need to be, uh, to be rejigged because how easy mm -hmm. is it to convict a sexual abuser? I, I, I learned it's very difficult. Well, actually, it's very, it's very, 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 very difficult. Okay. That's a lot of berries. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, that is the way the system is structured. But, but what makes it that is that most times, because when people become victims of rape they don't, or any form of abuse, because of that stigma that, that goes with it, they don't come out on time to say it. And once time passes by, the, 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 the difficulty in proving some of this cool. thing becomes even more, uh, you, you, you understand. So I think in order to, uh, for the legals, for the, for the, for the judicial process to uh, make serious impact, I think it, victims of abuse who also um, have to step up to quickly communicate um, whenever they, are, they, are, they, they become victims. Well, I think they'll be able to step up and quickly communicate mm -hmm. if we have a strong leadership. It brings us back to that you know, issue you, of the yeah, exactly. institutional response. Per, the about personality the behind women, the Ministry women, of Women, women Affairs, Affairs yes. should be fierce enough for her to have the clout yes. and the, the attention of the people. So when she speaks of that, this kind of thing is happening in our society. People it, immediately it, get behind it. it. They it, give her the support it, she needs. Yes, but also... Part of this also comes from the family, from culture. Mm -hmm. If if we um, are culturally, uh, we culturally believe in certain things, it becomes even difficult because from the well, they said the family is the uh, is the SI unit of the society. So from the family, we've already killed it. What, 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 what else can even the institution do when the family that. has already buried the issue? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, our time is up for this segment of the program. The advocate is never complete without your inputs. Temi Alade Alamudun says, Nigerians need a reorientation of mindset for nation building.
starting from our primary education, family units, and from grassroots. And we, Nigerian citizens, legislative, judiciary, and executive arms of government must agree to put in, put in effective systems of government and policies that can build a nation regardless of political parties. Follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook, um, that's Plus TV Africa, hash the advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hash the advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com front slash the advocate NG. After this break, Ejama is take, talking about our responsibility to produce local children picture story books that depict our culture using the likeness of our children. Stay with us. It is on us. It is our responsibility and duty to produce local and indigenous picture storybooks for children that depict our culture and tradition, that use the likeness of our children, our phenotype and our surrounding. When children see their likeness in books and on television, it gives a sense of acceptance and the confidence of being enough. It always gladdens my heart when children interrupt me when I'm reading any of my books and they exclaim, my name is Dara, my brother is Ike, my friend is Tishefumi or Suraj. They can relate to the story. It is easier for them to read and understand because of course it is their reality. While foreign books, stories and heroes are not bad, reading them alone is insufficient for our children how do they learn that they are enough when they don't read books that reflect them? There is so much to do as it relates to picture story books for children zero to seven, seven years in Nigeria. Every topic that relates to children must be depicted in picture story books for this group of readers. Corporate bodies must step forward to assist authors of picture story books. Literacy award organizers must create a category for authors of picture story books so as to promote this art. The government must provide indigenous picture story books for public libraries and schools. Well-meaning individuals should consciously support younger readers and initiative for this age of readers. The media must advocate for support for this class of readers. Schools should insist on more indigenous picture story books now more than ever, since we have contemporarily well-done picture story books. Book vendors should stock indigenous picture story books and tell their customers about the importance of these books. Literacy competition organizers should allocate a slot for authors and illustrators of picture story books that carry the Nigerian undertone. How then can you expect a 10-year-old to magically become a reader when he or she has not been reading since he was one or two years old? It is not magic. It must be taught to be inherent in a child to read. That is how to groom readers. It is not shocking that Nigerian authors are not selling thousands or hundreds of thousands of books. They cannot because we have not taught children to read. So, who will buy the books you are writing? Not foreigners, of course. They have their own books to digest. We must create our own reading generation. People call to ask, is it true that you have sold over 12,000 copies of your books in two years? The answer is yes. The children are hungry for the stories that affect them, for the pictures that show their reality. So we must keep this up. Imagine my current readers in 15, 20 years time. They will be parents and they will gladly buy my books for their own children because it is inherent in them. Another issue we must discuss is getting these books to less privileged children and children in public schools. The government can do so much here if they can provide these quality picture story books to children from disadvantaged backgrounds. It will go a long way in restating that they are loved and that they matter to the society. Apt. Very, 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 very apt. Um, first off, I'm hearing for the first time that you sold about 12,000 copies uh, of your book. Yes, yeah, true. Well, so um, big ups. Big Thank ups, you. Big and ups they say that. a picture 
is worth a thousand, a thousand words. words. Yes, of course. Uh, as I was saying, the part of it that struck me has to do with uh, decolonizing, decolonizing our educational system. Sure. You see, the tendency to uh, depict um, impressions or images or information uh, with foreign, um, foreign characters goes to how this back to our colonial system. It's, it means that over 60 years after our colonial masters left us, um, uh, we still continue to exhibit um, an, 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 a, a, a hangover of, of colonialism or colonial instincts, so much that we have now fused it into our educational system. And that's the worst place you can ever fuse it, because that's where, you, that's the, that's where the, ch the child becomes socialized after the family. Most families are so busy these days, and they push the responsibility to the schools. And if children are exposed to an educational background where their, 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 their nationalistic psyche is shaped by foreign uh, images, then it really affects that sense of nationalism which we ought to build. And of course, one, another thing that is very common, I don't know if Comfort has had this kind of experience, is you go to a bookstore and you want to pick up a book, and for a child, of course, and all the picture story books, I'm particular for ages zero to seven, ages zero to seven, and mm -hmm. they tell you that, oh, we don't have, um, we, don't, we don't stock, we don't stock Nigerian authors, and I'm mortified because I'm looking at the young man that is saying that, and I'm thinking in my mind, have you traveled around the world? Do you know that the white man would definitely stock his own books on his shelf? So why are you telling me that you're not stocking um, mm. Nigerian picture story books? Mm. But I must say that it's a new, it's a new breed of authors that we have now. And it's something that we all need to key into. Comfort, what, what do you think about keying into this kind of um, initiative? Uh, I think it, it goes back to what um, uh, Mr. Raymond said about um, colonialism. I, I don't know, for some funny reason, we moved, suddenly moved from what we understood, understand, to what we don't understand. And that's what we've imbibed in our lives. Growing up, um, we still used to sit down when there was no light and we'll be told stories. I'm guilty. I grew up and now I started doing the bedtime story nonsense, lying high in the bed, talking them in, uh, sitting down. That was not how it was. And then speaking in English. So the second point here is that going with your title, it is on us. How many parents read? How many parents have, have the culture of having a home library? How many parents actually take the time to tell their, their children the indigenous story stories that they grew up knowing? And let's be honest, they are, they, the percentage is negligible. And so when you go into the store and the store man says, we do not stop that, it's because of the reactions he's also been getting from his customers, who, number one, will totally ignore the books, or if he offers the books uh, um, to the, uh, the parent, they say, please, 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 I'm looking for Mallory Towers. Give me any Python, you know, <laughs> give me, the, you know, they call all the Oibo ones because uh, that's the one that they know. And so, uh, again, I think your topic for me is up. The, the, the tagline is up. It is on us. These children come to us blank slates. It's what we write on, the, on their hearts. It's what we write into their lives that they end up imbibing. Why have we lost it? What happened? And going back to the indigenous languages, I, 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 it would be lovely to see a awakening of that because I'm surprised. Um, um, growing up, my, I didn't learn English per se at home. You know, it was in school because I was, it was deliberate. You learned the language in the house first, and then you go and learn English as, um, uh, as the, the secondary, which I tried to do in my, own, in my own home. I mean, it was a bit tough because everywhere everybody's speaking English, even those that can't speak the English. So it, 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 it became a challenge. And so, you know, going forward, it, it's still the issue of being deliberate. How do we get a reading culture in the schools? You know, the, just not just the reading clubs, the children who are gifted, how are they being, you know, extracted? You know, how are they being encouraged to, you know, continue on that path? Because they'll become the next generation authors. And so if there isn't that deliberate uh, um, action from the home, it is on us and the schools uh, to take them to the next level, then we're still going to have a death at the well, end of the speaking day. About, speaking about deliberate um, effort uh, to bring about a different outcome. Um, um, you talked about how the government and the corporate organizations can actually play 
in that space. And I think I actually agree with you because um, I remember those days when we were, we were growing on primary secondary school, we have um, the certain, certain books we are recommended to us. When our parents come to get a list of books, there are some books that they are meant to buy. So I think a way to address this issue is to put in indigenous children storybooks in the list in the curricula of schools so that parents will be forced to get them so I, that I, those I, children I, I'm sure. will read them. And also corporate organizations and NGOs who support educational courses can also dedicate. But if, if I become, come in there, I'm sure that there are indigenous books in school curriculum. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue that we might have is what are the quality of the books in the school curriculum? Because you might find that. Uh, well, for children books, how much quality? We, we, but, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, Omani has a point. Because, because, True, they are available, but you will realize that the gap is for ages zero to seven. Okay. So if you get to a primary one, for example, where you have a six-year-old, seven-year-old, they have yeah. storybooks. Okay. But for, but for zero very, to very seven, they don't have storybooks that depict our culture. And that is where we need to enhance them. For corporate organizations, mm -hmm. most of them support literacy, support authors. They will tell you there is a, there is a, um, there is a competition a literacy award that authors should send in books that were published in a particular year. I'm not going to name a name now, but I knew that my book was not going to be selected because that age group of readers are neglected. So I submitted my book nevertheless. The names came out for the authors that won that category. Beautiful stories, beautiful titles, Nigerian authors, but of course the focus was ages eight and above. So they're more like children novels, not picture storybooks that you can show a one-year-old. Just before now, I was coming from an event and my books were on display and you had 10-year-olds coming to pick my storybooks. And I'm sitting there and I'm telling her that, darling, that book is too little for you. It's for younger readers. And she busted into tears. Well, all right. I think um, with that, you seem to be, uh, you are the heart of uh, solving this problem. But in any event, I think we've come to the end of um, the segment of... Um, of, of, of the program. After the break, Omoni is highlighting the importance of mentorship. Don't go anywhere. Mentorship, a must by alumni of public schools. As the years go by, we see a general decline in the quality of education in Nigeria. It is also worrying that there is a decline in our value system. Corruption and all sorts of immoral acts have always been a thing by a quiet minority. At a period, a young man who takes a new car to his father in the village must first declare his source of income before he gets the requisite blessings. Financial success was no success without integrity, diligence, and honesty. Many young people are now aspiring to be rich at any price. 419 used to be the preserve of mature, dubious men who knew they were committing crimes. But children barely out of their diapers engage in yahoo yahoo and have used all sorts of illogical reasons to justify defrauding helpless people of their rightful possessions. My friend taught in the public school system in Lagos State. He gave insight into the psyche of several students in the schools. Many public secondary school students have affiliation to cult groups now. He believed that many of these children had lost their ways before their teens. They are the hope of tomorrow, only before the clock 10. The alumni of my secondary school, FGC Odubulu, has repeatedly given back to the school in the last few years. We have built, painted, donated, bought, name it. That has been the story year after year. There was a year that a group executed a solar lighting system project so that, the, so that the students would have lighting in their dormitory under any circumstance. It was a gesture that would have given them what many Nigerians lack, light all night long. Alas, the students vandalized the switches and fittings before commissioning. That was a cry for help. Several young people need help to, to think are right. I came across an initiative of the old students of FGC Enugu. 
the organizers recruited alumni willing to be mentors and got 50 volunteers. Each alumnus got two mentees, a day student and a brother. They were matched according to gender and as much as possible by the career part of the students. There must be rules of engagement. So a teacher and an alumnus explain to the under students the benefits of having a mentor and the expectations. For instance, the students were never to request financial aid. They were encouraged to be actively engaged and passionate. One of the results is that 30% of the enrollees still communicate with their mentors years after leaving secondary school. They have remained sounding boards and guiding lights. The mentors have helped some of them to get scholarship to study in universities out of Nigeria. The alumni, the alumni Association of Public Secondary Schools in Nigeria have been aggregating and using their financial resources to mitigate infrastructural de decay in their former schools. This ought to be the primary responsibility of the school's owners. But a better contribution from the alumni will be to become active role models and create mentorship systems that would handhold the youth on their path to success. Nigeria will be great again. Wow. Your script just, um, it for me, it just speaks to the, the loss of uh, the value system. And um, it's quite unfortunate that today you are only relevant to the extent of how much or how well you are picking up the bills. And um, it gives me a sense of concern. Even for some of us who are still young professionals trying to um, do the time to build ourselves to the position we aspire for ourselves, most times we come off as funny. Because you see some persons who have taken the fast lane, um, making the money, and then if you're not careful, you, 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 if you're not strong enough in terms of your, 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 your sense of character, you may, you, may, you, may, you may tow that path. And of course, it has to go back to the educational institution where students, students are nurtured, how they emerge from this, um, this school system. And um, what you talked about, the need for schools, alumni of schools to set up this mentorship program for students is really very, very, very uh, uh, important. As a matter of fact, I'm going to pick it home and recommend the same for uh, my, uh, my alma mater. You understand? Certainly. Because, because if, I knew what I, if I knew what I know now 10 years ago, True. True. if I had the opportunity or the privilege of mentors who would have advised me, my parents were not who went to school, you, have, you understand? So imagine if I had the opportunity of having mentors who directed my path, asked me, the role, asked me the right question, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do that? I feel I, I would have even gotten even further, further than I am today. Quicker. So we cannot overestimate the importance of mentorship. Let me just round up with this. A few days ago, someone, uh, Prof. Kinsley Mohalu, tweeted that he, he just, someone just called him, one of his mentees years ago just called him to tell him that he had attained a new position in his organization. And he was thanking him for his mentorship many years ago. So that just helps to put in clear context the importance of mentorship, particularly for young persons who are still coming up. And I think for children from disadvantaged backgrounds, what it does is that it helps them to stay above their present mm. state their, or their present financial lack. Because sometimes yeah. when you are in that situation where there's, there's a lot of lack, yeah. you don't want to focus on morals. You just want to get by from day to day. And of course, it becomes easy for peer pressure to set in, mm -hmm. for vices to set in, for you to be completely distracted. Yeah. So when you, when you have a mentor and you can keep your eyes on the ball yeah. and you're looking up and saying, okay, this is attainable. Then when people come and distract you with, oh, come, let's go join a gang, mm. come, let's go vandalize, mm. you can actually um, set your eyes on the ball and stay focused regardless of your present circumstances. Exactly. Exactly. You know? exactly. But it's quite unfortunate that poverty is prevalent in our society because to a large extent it contributes to um, the situation true, whereby true, students true. Um, join gangs mm. or the get-rich-quick attitude. True. And that's what I tell people, that you tell people to invest in picture storybooks that are beautiful. Something beautiful and quality costs money. Yeah. But here comes a father that is worried about feeding his children. 
He's not worried about buying school fee, paying yeah, school fees. Yeah. And the last one on his mind is um, buying the picture storybook. It still comes to that poverty mentality yeah. because they, they, they don't have food on their table, they don't have a roof over their heads. Then somebody is coming to tell them, you know, how <laughs> to be mentor. upright. Uh, uh, there's, there's a lot to be to be done about the root cause of the yeah, you know, vices. Yeah, and, and you, it ties down to a lot of the things we've talked about earlier about the that shows you the importance of um, mentorship because at the end of the day, if you want a young man to respect the body of a woman, he needs to have been taught yeah. to do that. that a woman's body is... Yeah, a, because comfort actually mentioned that too. An object of exploitation. Yeah, yes. it, it, it's, it's sacred. You know, just like comfort, Adelia said. Yeah. It's a right? cultural comfort. issue. Comfort. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. I'm listening. Yo, yo, I, I, um, uh, we're actually highlighting mentorship and um, gender effects on it. Um, yes, um, some, um, I think Mr. Raymond mentioned the issue of the value system and the value system is from the home. And let's be honest, I mean, I'm not, I'm not making any gender um, issues here, but let's be honest, the person who, who holds that um, button in the home is the female again. And we, we are raising young men, young women. How are we raising them? And it on this that further underscores this issue of community involvement in bringing up children. So at the family level, you know, they say, you know, it, it takes a community to bring up a child. The child moves out of, you know, your protection into the larger world. In the larger world, they're supposed to now be this community, which we're now going to call the mentors, who are supposed to be able to make themselves available um, to help people who are vulnerable, children or growing young adults who are vulnerable and um who need to know which way to go in life. And so two things here, um, those of us that have had the privilege and have been you know, lucky enough to be where we are, we too now need to consciously seek out opportunities where we can lend our time. Um, on a program called Narrative 4, and that's what they do. They just go around looking for people who are willing. You know, would you like to be what they call a big sister? And they pick children from public schools, interestingly, and they pair you. Yes, they pick us from, and, and I was involved in one. It was an enriching experience. It was, I mean, in the beginning, it was awkward, you know, because, you know, you come from a certain background and you see and you wonder what you've taken for granted. These people are lapping it up. And so it's a, it's a, um, beautiful topic, but there's and there's the need. These children are under pressure. Everything. I mean, it was heartbreaking, you know, to talk to some of them at all. But there are platforms out there. I think that are coming out and realizing that mentorship is key. As uh, Ms. Raymond said, also, if I had a mentor, even just five years ago, not ten. I would be five years further on in my own life now. Talk more of the, you know, talk yeah. more of these kids that are in a society that is ravaged by insecurity, as you said, the poverty, the get rich quick schemes, um, in social media pushing forward the, you know, falsehood and buying into it. Um, so um, kudos, and I, I hope um, we get the opportunity to work more on um, being mentors, not just around our schools, but even in our own, you know, communities. Exactly. exactly. I think I was going to uh, advocate that. I think there is a role for uh, religious institutions uh, in this space, in this connection, because a um, few days ago, I think it was Deputy Governor of Lagos at a function in honor of Latif Jaconde, the former, the late former governor of Lagos State. And he said that people now listening to their pastors, they listen to their imams more than more they listen than. to the government. Sure. You understand? So there is this, there is this, there is a great role for tradition, uh, for religious institutions to play in this place. These pastors, imams, and all of that. Children, our parents should be able to volunteer to take their children to some of these okay. to for mentorship um, opportunities. Okay, so and there's a, and also within their system, they can they can set up mentorship program and encourage parents to bring their children to take the benefits. They could assign mentors. Okay. To these children, and just like Comfort said, um, we can we can uh, take it up from there. Okay, so, so in, in I beg to defer on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I will hear your, <laughs> I will hear your <laughs> differing opinion. 
I completely beg to differ on this one. Look, religion has caused us enough harm at this oh, point yeah. until the religious institutions get their act together, know exactly why God allowed uh, the, the um, traditional God called them to be. They are going to cause you more problem. What they're teaching people more is about the intangibles of life, how to get visa, how to get wife, how to oh. um, buy new uh, car, how to whatever. What, what we need is the enrichment of the spirit, the the soul of people. You know, people, if people learn to be kinder, to be more honest, that is what they're supposed to teach. That's not what they're teaching. So for me at this point, I, oh, I'm sorry. Leave religion okay. out. It's okay. Wow. 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 It's okay. That's really, really awesome. <laughs> you know, the thing about the advocate is that time is never our friend on this program. However, <laughs> Advo the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time on this station, remember that important conversations are among the necessary tools for a sinner society. Bye for now. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.